Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmel Abau, but please call me Melai. I will be the moderator for this webinar. Welcome. Uh, this is a, a webinar on the phenomenon of abuse of Filipino domestic workers by Filipino diplomats. This effort actually started with a group chat no? among members of the Center for Migrant Advocacy, CMA, and the Working Group on Migration, or the WGM of Ateneo Political Science Department. We started the conversation immediately after news broke out, I think on October 25, about the abusive behavior of the Philippine ambassador to Brazil, Ambassador Marichu Mauro, as seen through videos showing the abuse. Our first reaction was, eto na naman, bakit may ganito pa rin? Um, because we knew that there have been similar cases in the past, no? and that this was not an isolated case. And in fact, this is why we thought of um, drawing in the Geneva Forum uh, for Philippine Concerns, because this organization already has a track record in assisting OFWs who were abused by their diplomat employers. Our second reaction was, um, baka wala na naman mangyayari dito because none of the previous cases of abuse were resolved in a fully satisfactory or a fully just manner. And because we know that we have this tendency to sweep issues like this under the rug, no? because this is about domestic work and it is considered private and therefore not part of public affairs. No? It's a very touchy topic that people usually just avoid. But both CMA and WGM have decided that this time we will push for a public conversation because the abuse that we saw on those Ambassador Mauro videos, that's the kind of abuse that diplomats are supposed to protect our OFWs from. So when diplomats are the abusers, that phenomenon should be a matter for public conversation and public concern because then the question arises. Who will protect our domestic workers if those duty bound to protect them are the ones abusing them? At first, we thought of just writing an article no, about the issue. This is why we approached Trappler. Uh, but then we decided maybe the issue required more back and forth of ideas and that more people uh, should be involved in the conversation. So this is why we ended up with this Rappler webinar. And we are very thankful to Rappler for allowing us this space. We all know this is a very controversial issue and a very emotional issue kasi nakakagalit, di ba? But what we hope to do today is to try to examine the facts, converse about perspectives, and really try to grapple with this issue as objectively as we can. And we hope to answer at least two questions today. One, how should the Ambassador Mauro case be viewed and how should it be dealt with? Senator Zubiri and several labor groups have already publicly called for the removal of Ambassador Mauro from her diplomatic post and from the Foreign Service. The United Domestic Workers of the Philippines, an affiliate of the International Domestic Workers Federation, has also asserted that reparations be made for the harm done on the domestic worker. So should we also call for removal and reparations? That is the first question. Question number two. How do we prevent this kind of abuse from happening again and again? Or even if we can't stop it altogether, it must be clear what recourse domestic workers can take if they find themselves in such circumstance of abuse. To answer those two big questions, this is the process that we will follow today. Three presentations for around 10 minutes each, two brief reactions for around two to three minutes each, and then an open discussion. Let me just brief you about the presentations. Ellen Sana, Executive Director of CMA, will first give the overview no, or the context of this issue and explain to us why we should consider it a phenomenon and not just one case. Then Joseph Sisip, current chair of the Geneva Forum and attorney um, John Pierre Garbad, a Swiss lawyer, will be sharing with us their experiences in assisting OFWs who were abused by Geneva-based Filipino diplomats. The final presentation will be done by, by my colleagues from the Ateneo Political Science Department. Mr. Oliver Quintana and Dr. Medina Salao will be discussing the policy environment, no? what international and national laws should guide us in dealing with this issue and uh, what studies are available out there. 
we actually invited the DFA, no, the Department of Foreign Affairs, particularly USEC Sara Ariola of UMWA and USEC Eduardo Malaya, USEC for Administration. But unfortunately, they did not accommodate our invitation. Uh, we don't want to speculate why, but we will definitely continue to engage the DFA on this issue and to continue to invite them not to enlighten us on this issue. So after the three presentations, I will call on two reactors. First will be Cecilia Jimenez, uh, Cecilia Jimenez Damari, former chair of the Geneva Forum, who's also a human rights lawyer and a UN special rapporteur on the human rights of internally displaced persons. And then I will call Dr. Liberty Chi, a former colleague at Ateneo who now teaches at the university in the Netherlands. Dr. Chi has done several studies on the topic of migrant domestic work. After that, I will begin the open forum where you viewers and participants can ask the speakers questions or where you can share your own suggestions on the two questions I mentioned earlier. One, what to do with the Ambassador Mauro case, and two, how to prevent abuse from happening again. In the interest of time, we will mas maximize the chat box no, for the open forum. Uh, we will need to manage the time because we have allotted only 1.5 hours for this webinar. So friends, let's now begin this very difficult but much needed conversation. I would now like to call on Ms. Ellen Sana to make the first presentation. Ellen, please. Thank you, Melai, and um, greetings, warm greetings. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. So as Melai said, I'll be touching a little bit on, this is the, the work that we do at the Center for Migrant Advocacy and what is our take on the matter. Uh, and I thought that this day will not come when we will be discussing this openly in a public conversation, the issue of uh, the diplomats serving as employers and not as duty bearers this time. So, okay. So let me just, uh, okay. So let me start off by saying that since 2014, we have more women migrants uh, the number of women migrants outpaced the number of male migrants every year. And last year, we had 56% of OWs as women, 56% uh, are women migrants compared to 44% only of the male migrants. And out of this, which is about 1.2, 62.5% of these women migrants were working as domestic workers. And we always say, and this has been established, that migrant domestic workers who are uh, predominantly, overwhelmingly women are disproportionately vulnerable, not only because they are women, they are migrant workers, but because they are in occupations that are not recorded or covered by many labor and social laws. Uh, the, the work is unregulated, undervalued, unrecognized, underpaid, overworked, etc. as you can see from the slides. No, So it is their living and working conditions that make them quite vulnerable to abuse. And you can check from the records here, this is a compilation of data, uh, pre-COVID for that matter, that in terms of the abuse, distress, and traffic migrants, overwhelmingly the victim survivors were women, as you can see. And cognizant of this vulnerability of our OFWs, and particularly our women migrants, and within the subsector, subset of the women migrants are the domestic workers, our government exerted effort to put in place policies, no? So we have the Magna Carta for migrant workers, uh, and then we have the HSW policy reform package, which uh, take up the whole issue of protection for migrant domestic workers. Uh, 2018, the POEA also issued a memorandum circular uh, providing guidelines for diplomats who will be allowed to uh, directly hire domestic migrant domestic workers because the norm is that you're not supposed to do direct hiring uh, especially of the domestic workers, but they take exceptions to diplomats and those members of the international organizations. No? Apart from national legislations, we also resorted to forging of bilateral agreements. And at the international community, of course, we kind of like uh, the global model in terms of being a state party to all United Nations core conventions on human rights and also the ILO uh, fundamental conventions to protect uh, labor. Uh, 
And in 2011, not only are we a party to the Convention 189 on Decent Work for Domestic Workers, but the Philippines took a very active role in making sure that the provisions of 189 were robust and will really protect our migrant, uh, our all domestic workers, including migrant workers. Of course, the CEDO, uh, we are also a party to the CEDO, but I would like also to emphasize that when the CEDO committee was crafting General Recommendation 26, which pertains to protection, strengthening the protection for low-wage women migrant workers, again, the Philippines uh, took an active role in, in pushing for this and having it adopted in 2008. Of course, we are also a party to the UN Migrant Workers Convention. Uh, and uh, we also take pride in the fact that when we hosted the ASEAN uh, Summit in 2017, it, uh, we made it um, uh, a point to finally have the ASEAN consensus to protect migrant workers in, in the region, which was also part of the requirement of uh, the ASEAN Declaration of 2007 that we also, the Philippines, took a lead role in. And of course, apart from all of this that pertains directly to protection of our migrant workers and specifically our migrant domestic workers, the Foreign Service Act or the, of the Department of Foreign Affairs affirms as well that the protection of the rights and promotion of the welfare and interests of Filipino overseas become, becomes part of the third pillar of the Philippine foreign uh, policy. We also have a national legislation on uh, domestic workers. Apart from all these uh, provisions to protect our migrant workers and migrant domestic workers, there are explicit provisions in the law that elaborates on the, our policy as a state, but also on the specific role of government agencies. As we can see from uh, Section 2A on the Declaration of Policy, affirming that the state shall, in red, at all times uphold the dignity of its citizens, whether in country or overseas, in general, and Filipino migrants workers in particular. I'm putting this here so that we can revisit what the law provides and we don't just put it under the under the under wraps, no, so to speak. Uh, additionally, Section 27 of the same Magna Carta for Migrant Workers also mentioned, remind uh, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs of their mandate that uh, it should be the highest priority concern of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs and the Philippine Foreign Service Post. That is the protection of our OFWs and the promotion of their welfare in particular and the protection of the dignity and fundamental rights and freedoms of the Filipino citizen abroad. Section 28 also affirms the one country team approach. And this is a, an interesting uh, provision because of course at the post, it is the ambassador that is the, the head of the post and it should be making the recommendation to the secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs for the recall, for the recall of officers, representatives and personnel who will be acting in, who will be uh, uh, caught in acts inimical to the national interest, but also for failure to provide the necessary services to protect the rights of overseas Filipinos. So these are all in the Magna Carta for migrant workers. Uh, but then, and of course, uh, the Philippines is considered a global model when it comes to protection of our migrant workers. Therefore, just to reiterate the, uh, the statement of Melai, so what must we do when the perpetrators are no less than the primary duty bearers who have been sworn to protect and uphold the rights of our migrant workers. Not only do they violate this duty, but they abuse their authority as well as diplomats. They act with impunity and even invoke diplomatic immunity to escape accountability. And this, of course, uh, is a good occasion to refresh our minds because of the uh, uh, case of Ambassador Marichu uh, Mauro. So, uh, and this was in the report in the in the media that the uh, the victim was physically assaulted many times and in many days. I think in one report it was from March to September, and these are very typical actuations of employers against domestic workers private employers of domestic workers slapping, pulling the helper's ear, hitting the helper with an umbrella. And as, Ma, as Mel, I said, this is not uh, the first time. This has been like the end time that this has occurred. 
no uh involving a filipino diplomat for that matter and a filipino migrant domestic workers if you will recall in the past and some of these cases uh cma uh was able to 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 attend to you will note that the the abuses the pattern of abuses are very similar to what we have been protesting against uh in the cases of our domestic workers in 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 the middle east in in the other places in singapore in malaysia in hong kong you know diplomats was confiscating the passport uh, working uh, excessively long hours 126 hours per week 15 hours a day seven days a week no decent meals no decent accommodation so these are all like in in different times 2008 2004 and this one is 2005 2013 but the forms of abuse are quite similar to to each other no and uh, again this one also in 2014 and in canada so the abuses are typically experienced by our migrant domestic workers from bad employers private employers long hours of work no rest period no days off underpayment unclear contracts withholding of wages withholding of passports indecent accommodations almost like starvation meals verbal physical psychological abuse threat and deception like you should not be going out because the police will arrest you what is that restricted mobility involuntary servitude etc but at the same time, we have to reflect our diplomat employers perhaps are far worse than the private employers because they are paid by our taxes, by people's taxes as duty bearers. And they actually even violate our own laws and those of the host countries. They do not follow the minimum wage law. They do not follow the prescriptions that we put in our memorandum circular on how to treat the, our migrant domestic workers. And this is an interesting uh, letter that we unearthed, we retrieved. This is uh, way back in 2006. This is a letter addressed to me. I had to retype it because you cannot see clearly the, the, the original. But you can see from this that the way the issue was uh, uh, addressed by the Department of Foreign Affairs then was that this was a purely private legal dispute and they are not intervening as institution, even if the person uh, being charged of a uh, slavery-like situation is one of them. And then there was also this very interesting uh, paragraph where she says that her salary is not enough to cover the payment. And then I was, I'm actually shocked because the, you are posted in, in Switzerland and you are only given 8,764 pesos a month and additional 2,000. And you have three children and, and a husband who is unemployed. How do you live? In that, in that, in that very, very meager income is is really like unbelievable. So I'm not really sure if this is really like, uh, if this is true. And that's why it would be good to have the DFA confirming about this. And so the end of the letter is, I hope with this letter you will be able to understand my financial situation. But we're talking of somebody that who worked for her for many years, more than one year, and she did not pay her. And therefore, the, the court actually ordered her to pay. And this is what she, she replied to that. And incidentally, the same person is still active in the, in the service, uh, in the foreign service, and she's actually with the ambassador uh, to, to, to Brazil. So it's very interesting. Huh? And so what have been the responses? And I was, I was, I was really like uh, uh, surprised because uh, in the 2014 uh, incident, uh, the DFA spokesperson was quoted to say, oh, we take very seriously any allegations of misconduct of his employees. 2016, he says practically the same thing. And I'm not very sure what was the end of this investigation, 2014 and 2016. Of course, there was this other thing that took 10 years to be to be to be heard in in Geneva because of the in, because the diplomat invoked diplomatic immunity but finally after 10 years there was a verdict and what happened the the, the diplomat involved was actually promoted or reappointed to the same position despite our strong uh, 
uh, protest, our strong opposition to it, no? So it is very interesting and, and we welcome the immediate action of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs now. That immediately he took the 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 he 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 immediately uh, took action on the case of the ambassador to Brazil and uh, uh, by Monday of this November 9, charges were already served at uh, the the ambassador. No, so but we also would like to make mention that the host governments. Uh, action on the cases are also uh, welcome and appreciated because uh, they proceeded with the case, especially when the diplomat was uh, uh, completed the, 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 the tour of duty and they rendered the verdict or they denied the motion to dismiss by these employers, diplomat employers. So maybe just to, to end this uh, short uh, sharing, what have we learned from all of these experiences? And it's really very heartbreaking that these things keep on happening. Uh, the first case we documented was in early 2000, and this is already 2020. So one is we have to walk the talk. We take the leadership in terms of promoting or advancing a rights-based framework or approach to migrant uh, labor. But then we are not we are not walking the talk. So we should do that. We should lead by example. And we say that abusive diplomat employers must go. They have no right to be in public service. Second, for the DFA to establish clear guidelines with accountability for diplomat employers to reinforce the memorandum circular of the POEA, to check and monitor on the situation of the migrant domestic workers, and to treat the issue not only as private issue between the diplomat employer and the migrant domestic workers. Number three, this is basic rule. We say this to private employers. If you cannot afford them, don't get one. Basic rule, do not hire if you cannot treat them decently. And decently has four components to that, you know, a pair definition of the ILO. And you should treat them with dignity and to abide, to, to adhere to, to, to the laws, abide by the laws and policies also of the countries of destination. And it's very disheartening that they are the ones trying to circumvent the laws of the host countries. Also, for the FA to ensure that the diplomats and the members of their families, because in many of these cases of abuses, the, the, the abusers extend to the members of the families. They do not, they should not be using their positions in activities that can be construed as trafficking and or for financial gains. In one instance, you know, they, they use the diplomatic uh, cloak to, to fast track the, the processes, the securing of, of uh, the documents of the passports, and then trying to, okay, you just uh, com uh, comply, tell them that you will be my domestic worker, when in fact, the negotiation was not about that. We also take note in one case at least that members of diplomatic of the diplomatic or can be complicit with the wrongdoing of their colleagues. And we should not be condoning this. We should not be uh, doing this. We should behave professionally and not be complicit for wrongdoings of their colleagues. We should try to revisit and maybe understand because many of probably for us, we do not really use, uh, think about this Vienna Convention on Consular and Diplomatic Relations, but we think we should be doing um, a revisiting of this applicability of the diplomatic immunity. It delays for sure the justice to the aggrieved and migrant domestic workers. And finally, how about considering the enforcement of foreign judgment? For example, in one of the cases where the judge, where the court orders to pay the domestic workers the back wages and other benefits. I remember this and I was inspired by the gesture of Secretary Luxine that he immediately uh, extended like uh, he, 200,000 pesos to the domestic worker of uh, Ambassador Mauro. So if he can do that, why can't we consider that this foreign judgment be uh, enforced and implemented, even if uh, in, in, in the case where it involved our Filipino diplomats and our own domestic workers? And I think that's it for now for me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ellen. I think you clarified a lot 
of things for us, the situation. And of course, I think you lessons, lessons learned that you presented, um, uh, some were appeals, some were very concrete recommendations. I think we can, we can, uh, we can discuss that in the open forum. No? But for now, I think just one additional bit to the Ambassador Mauro context is that um, actually the complaint was lodged by, I think, the colleagues. No? So in other words, there's also, there's also the aspect here of whistleblowing, right? To be able to raise these complaints, um, there, there's also that phenomenon no? that um, the, worker, the worker herself could not just complain. No? They, they, you, you had to, to, you had other actors to do that. Okay, so thank you very much, Ellen. Can I now call on Joseph and uh, Pierre for the Geneva experience? Yes. Yes. Hello, Pierre. Hello, uh, uh, Joseph. I, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I understand Joseph is speak oh. first, right? Is that correct? Okay, let's just wait mm, for. Sure. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Joseph. We hear you. Please start. Thank you. Okay. 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 Good morning from Geneva. I was tasked to share Geneva, the Geneva Forum introduction. So uh, here's a brief introduction of the Geneva Forum for Philippine Concerns. Um, we have these objectives uh, to provide support to the migrant workers empowerment, particularly in Geneva and to contribute to the general integration efforts of Filipinos in Switzerland to raise awareness and provide space for discussions for, of Philippine issues, including uh, further enhancing the participation of Filipinos in Geneva in these issues and assisting visiting Filipinos to meet like-minded Filipinos in Geneva. Uh, the Geneva Forum was established uh, under the Article 6 of the Swiss uh, Civil Code. So it's a formal association of Geneva Filipinos and Swiss friends. This was uh, started in 1989. No, we started as a forum for information, discussions of Philippine issues and realities. This began with uh, three lunch forums organized by Filipinos working with the uh, World Council of Churches, and NGOs. Now, since then, uh, the Geneva Forum has also been active as a support group for Philippine-based human rights NGOs lobbying at the UN Commission on Human Rights, and now it's called the Human Rights Council, no? and other related bodies. Uh, in 1989, we felt that you know we were talking about U UN human rights uh, issues in, in the Philippines, then we, we felt that, you know, in Geneva, there were 80% Filipinos, Filipinos in Geneva, no? the population of the Filipinos. So we started to get this uh, complaints of domestic workers. So in in, eight, in 19, 1998, we, we came out with the first English edition of Know Your Rights. This was uh, authored by Jean-Pierre Garbad. And after a while, the other nationalities, the, non, the French and uh, Spanish-speaking national, nationalities wanted uh, to have their copy, so we, we, we printed out the French and the Spanish uh, copies. And in the latest one was uh, this one, the Claim Your Rights, which again was uh, authored by Jean-Pierre Garbad. Since the, since the year 2000, we've been active also in the campaign for domestic 
worker strikes in the diplomatic sector. So we, Geneva Forum participated in UN meetings, uh, the, like the Commission on the Human Rights Council and the UN Committee on Migrant Workers. We, so we, we had domestic helpers themselves uh, going to, to give uh, oral interventions at the UN. This was facilitated by the Forum, uh, the Center for Migrant Advocacy, and Migrant Rights International. No? We were also part of the regularization, regularization campaign for the undocumented. Uh, the Geneva Forum is also a member of the committee, the Sotien of Saint Papier, and we work with local NGOs, associations, and trade unions. Uh, in 2017, we initiated the task force regularization to arouse, organize, and mobilize the migrant domestic workers in the Filipino community. So we, we also work with, uh, like I said, Center for Migrants Advocacy and the Commission on Filipino Migrant Workers based in Amsterdam. So now I was, I'm going to give a summary of the, at least the two cases of the abuse by domestic, by, uh, by diplomats. So the first case, this, this are, these are the summaries given by jean -Pierre. The first case is the case of Dora. We'll call her Dora. Dora, oh, she, works, she worked two years as a household employee for a member of the staff of the Philippine Mission in Geneva. Let's call her Miss Clarissa T. So the, the, the diplomat, Miss Clarissa T, did not allow her to leave the house. Uh, pretending that she would be uh, arrested by the police and sent back to the Philippines, even if she was holding a regular working permit. So she was always threatened of being arrested if she would go out. No, she So the, the diplomat also confiscated her passport. So the, I think this has been, this is quite normal. Uh, practice by diplomats, they confiscate the, the passport. So Dora's salary was 180 uh, a month only. This is less than 10% of the minimum wage here in Switzerland. Uh, it was increased to 240 after the husband of Clarissa T found the job. But the employer kept the salary and used it only when Dora asked her to buy things or send money to her family in the Philippines. So totally, in two years, she, she only sent uh, $2,600. Not only that, Dora worked 15 hours a day. She had no day off. She did cleaning, preparing the food, uh, even hand, hand laundry to, to save electricity, uh, ironing taking care of the handicapped children who vomited often what he ate. Uh, and she brought him to school twice a day and accompanied him home. Um, the diplomat, Mrs. Clarissa T, insulted her often calling her patangatanga, lazy and stupid. When they transferred to another apartment, Dora had to sleep on the floor of the living room. Imagine during the winters, she would be sleeping on the floor. Uh, malamig yan, no? Anyway, on the 5th of uh, December, to year 2000, the diplomat asked Dora to pack all her things and said that they would bring her back to the Philippines the next morning because they did not like the way that she left the house alone on her free time without permission. So she was not allowed to leave the house or to see a friend and shouted at her that if she refused to leave, she would call the police and accompany them to the airport. Then uh, the diplomat told Dora that she was free to leave, but only through the window. 
And during that night, Dora attempted to escape the apartment through her window from the fourth floor. So making use of uh, makeshift ropes of clothes, she tried to go out the window, but unfortunately, the rope broke and she fell to the ground. She lost consciousness and was found by the police who brought her to the hospital. Her spine was broken and left her invalid, fortunately only slightly for the rest of her life. A nurse at the hospital contacted uh, Mr. Louis Seed from the trade union who contacted an attorney. With their help, Dora received financial compensation from the Swiss accident insurance and she got a residence permit. Today, she, she's mar she got ma married with the Swiss and has a job at the, at the, at the hotel. Mrs. Clarissa, the diplomat, had omitted to ensure her either at the social security system of the Philippines or the Swiss social security. Then uh, Dora, brought the diplomat, Miss Clarissa T, to the Geneva Labor Court. But Clarissa T had already fled Geneva. She was reassigned by the Department of Foreign Affairs to another country. She never paid the compensation ordered by the court. Uh, as of now, she, she, has, she was issued a warrant of arrest. However, uh, she is now presently working as a civilian attaché in the Brazil Embassy, the Philippine Embassy in Brazil. Uh, here is the, the newspaper clippings with the title, Wanting to Flee. The employee of a diplomat is injured by falling from the fourth floor. And this is uh, a picture of her with all the, the neck support and the rib support. Now we go to the case of Laura. In December 17, 2014, a former ambassador of the Philippines was convicted by a court in Geneva for profiteering or usury for having paid a Filipina OFW only 12% of Geneva's minimum wage. The domestic helper, Laura, claimed that she worked from 6 a.m. to midnight with no day off. Her employer did not appeal his conviction. Then the case dragged for 10 years because the ambassador invoked his diplomatic immunity. It is only after having tried in vain to reach an amicable settlement that the OFW Kasambahay filed a criminal complaint and that her former employer agreed to pay the minimum wage due until the day she had stopped working. However, he refused to pay any compensation for overtime, annual leave, and, ju and just dismissal. During the uh, Pinoy administration, Geneva Forum, uh, CMA, uh, request, uh, sent a petition to the Pinoy administration so he was he was removed, but unfortunately, under the new administration, at first he was uh, appointed as DFA USEC. We we also petitioned the government the, against this. We protested this, and after a while, he was again reinstated to his old job as ambassador. Uh, Geneva Forum, with the help of uh, Senator Risa Contiveros, tried to intervene at the Commission of Appointments, but uh, 
you are not able to stop this statement. Uh, um, if you want to get uh, a, a more um, full picture of the this this uh, issues, the the abuses of these two uh, orthodoxies in Geneva, uh, the probe team. Uh, had an episode on the Geneva OSW abuse. So there are two parts which I, which are in YouTube. So all right. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, Pierre, do you want to add anything to Joseph's presentation? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm uh, this Jean-Pierre Garbade who, who wrote these two uh, guides of uh, claim your rights and uh, the right of domestic helpers. Uh, we call them household employees in Switzerland. Now, I would, two things I would like to say. I was the lawyer of these girls, but I was the lawyer of dozens of other Filipinas and Filipinos since 1990. And what I saw is that the situation of uh, Filipino employees uh, of diplomats is especially difficult. They are especially vulnerable because of three reasons. First of all, in many countries, uh, they come with the diplomats, so they are from the same country, same nation, like Filipinos working for Philippine diplomats, Brazilians for Brazilian diplomats, the same. So, and they don't know anything about the country of the host country. So that they're totally vulnerable they don't know the language, they don't know the laws, they are totally dependent of their employer. And a normal employee, if they are exploited, they can change their employer, they can try to terminate and find another job. But a diplom an employee or a diplomat has a special status. These employees are not allowed to work in the normal uh, labor market. They have a special status. They are allowed to work for this diplomat and they are not allowed to work, to stop their work and, and find another job. So they're totally dependent. They cannot defend themselves because if they would defend them, they, they, it's like what happened with Dora. They would be sent back away. And then they live in, they live in the same household, no? Also because they don't know the country. So this special status makes it very difficult for them. And then from the side of the diplomat of staff of missions, uh, when you work for an employer, in, if, if you know people, you can go to local courts. But you know, with diplomats, uh, Joseph spoke about diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity means that diplomats have to obey to the local law, but you cannot attract them to the local, to, to, to courts. During their time, they are in, uh, in the post, in this host country, they are immune of jurisdiction. That means they have to obey, a, obey the law of the country, but if they don't, even if they kill somebody, they cannot, uh, you cannot make a complaint. You can make a complaint, but the, the judge cannot issue a warrant, cannot, uh, continue the proceeding until he leaves the post and goes home. So this makes it very difficult for an employee because when the, when the employer leaves the country, she can go to the court, but uh, how will she implement the law? And the, how it comes to the other problem? Laws are beautiful. Ellen told you about the beautiful laws we have everywhere in conventions and agreements and, and, and guidelines. Switzerland has beautiful laws, but if you cannot go to the court, if with a diplomat you, you have no means to implement the laws, they are useful, useless. And diplomats, this is another thing I want to say, uh, diplomats or staff working in a mission like uh, the employer of, uh, of uh, Dora, for instance, she was a, a low level employee in the mission in Switzerland with a salary, I don't know how high it was, but surely not very high. They, these people, uh, they, uh, I, I lost what I wanted to say, <laughs> but anyhow, what, what is important is that 
this uh, these people they cannot go to any uh, court to find justice. Now, naturally, they could go to the Philippines, but if you have a country like the Philippines with very, not say, let's say, a very weak justice system, uh, it's almost impossible for them to seek justice in Switzerland and in in Philippines. And imagine the cost of living. That's another problem. It is a real challenge for a country like the Philippines, which is a low, uh, it's, it's a cheap country. I mean, the, the, if you compare the salary, the minimum wages in Switzerland or in European country with, uh, with the Philippines, you must understand that 2,000 Swiss francs, which is the minimum wage in cash, you cannot live with 2,000 Swiss francs in Switzerland, but it's the minimum wage in cash you should receive as domestic. This is 100,000 Philippine pesos. Now, if naturally, if an employee, a, a diplomat, or a staff member of the mission of the Philippine mission in Switzerland would like to hire an employee, he, she must earn more than 100,000 pesos minimum and not 8,000 like this employer of Dora told. And I, I think this is a challenge for the budget of, uh, of the Philippines now. How much do they pay? Now, naturally, these diplomats, what I say, or staff of, Philippine, of missions, they, they are not obliged to hire an employee from their home country. They can hire an employee. They are allowed to hire an employee on the local labor market. There's a lot of Filipinos in Geneva who are looking for work. But no, they bring their own, their own employee. And this is the last point. Very often, it's like with Dora. The Dora, the employer of Dora, the staff member of the Philippine Mission in Geneva, was the first cousin, was her first cousin of Dora. So you can imagine the ties, the family ties, the pressure in the Philippines that she should accept, she can go to Switzerland. And in, in many cases, there was another case, Wilma, uh, Mary, I call her. Uh, she worked seven years for a Filipino agent of uh, an international organization. She also uh, had ties with the family. So this, all these people, uh, who have been hired in the Philippines and go with the Philippine diplomat in another country, they have links with the family or the mother worked already for her family or still continues to work. So if there's a pressure, please don't complain and so on. This is uh, some practical uh, ideas I wanted to launch in this uh, forum. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Per uh, and Joseph. I think um, the cases of Dora and Laura are really uh, should, should really guide us no, in this discussion. And, and, and also I thank Pierre for raising what you raised, Pierre, it's really a cultural aspect, no? the, the, how we course, relate yeah. to, to domestic workers and how, you know, in fact, in cases like those, domestic workers are supposed to even feel gratitude no? for having been brought yeah, about. Yeah, 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 right? and, yeah can uh, I tell you, this is one, one case, that I, if you allow me just to remember, I, I okay. received uh, emails from a diplomat, a Philippine diplomat, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, her employee, a Filipino, was working. And uh, I saw these emails. He wrote to his uh, former employee, the Filipina, and said, come on, we're Filipinos. We have to be solid. Look, this Swiss lawyer just wants to make money with you. We are mm -hmm. the same country, nationality, solidarity, you know, patriotism. This yeah. is the pressure also, okay. as you say. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. Now for our last set of presentations, we have um, uh, Oliver Cantana and uh, Melissa Lau, please. Thank you, Joseph and Pierre. Just be mindful of the time. Huh? It's um, 8 minutes to 3 p.m. But we're more or less still on, on, on time. Uh, thank you very much, Ma'am Melay. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, magandang hapon po sa lahat. My task for this afternoon is to discuss the policy environment surrounding the case at hand. One of the key questions we hope to answer is what law should be enforced to prevent this kind of abuse from recurring or happening again? Do these mechanisms provide enough protection to the domestic worker? Or should more laws or regulations be formulated? 
one of the existing laws we can look at is uh, RA0842, also known as the Migrant Workers and of Overseas Filipino Act of 1995, which establishes a higher standard of protection and promotion of the welfare of migrant workers, their families, and overseas Filipinos in distress. Section 23 specifically identifies the role of the DFA in taking priority action or making representation with any foreign authority concerned to protect the rights of migrant workers and other overseas Filipinos and to extend immediate assistance, including the repatriation of distressed migrants. Section 28 also says that the ambassador, acting as the leader of the mission, may recommend to the DFA secretary the recall of officers, representatives, and personnel of the Philippine government posted abroad for acts inimical to national interest or failure to provide the necessary services to protect the rights of overseas Filipinos. Now the question is, where do we turn to when it is the head of the mission, the ambassador himself or herself, the principal duty bearer, is the one who commits such deplorable acts? We also have uh, RA-715 Service Act or the Philippine Foreign Service Act of 1991, Section 51 of which provides that the Board of Foreign Service Administration of the DFA is responsible for making recommendations to the secretary concerning the policies and procedures to govern the selection, assignment, promotion, discipline, and separation from the service of chiefs of mission and other foreign service officers and staff. A caveat exists, though, which says that the chiefs of mission who are commissioned by the president as ambassadors extraordinary or pl and plenipotentiary shall not be investigated by the board or separate from the service unless there is an express written directive from the president. We must point out that this rule or privilege particularly applies only to ambassadors being presidential appointees and that cases filed against officers whose rank is below them is usually proceed without the need for a written directive from Malacanang. After the board turns over the recommendation to the SFA, formal charges will then be prepared by the Office of Treaty and Legal Affairs, or OTLA. Third, we can also look into the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, 1961 treaty that defines a framework of diplomatic relations between independent countries. Um, Article 9, Section 1 states that the receiving state may at any time notify the sending state that the head of the mission or any member of the diplomatic staff is persona non grata. In such cases, the sending state shall either recall the person concerned or terminate his or her functions with the mission. Article 31, on the other hand, says that the immunity of a diplomatic agent from the jurisdiction of the receiving state does not exempt him or her from the jurisdiction of the sending state. Fourth, we have RA 6713, or the Code of Conduct for Ethical Standards for Public Officials. Section 4C specifically states that public officials and employees must act with justness and sincerity and shall not discriminate against anyone and respect the rights of others. Fifth, we have a second international treaty, the International Labor Organization or ILO Convention Number no. 189 on decent work for domestic workers, which came into force in 2013. We must take note, as mentioned by uh, Ms. L earlier, the Philippines, a leading state in global migration governance, is one of the signatories. Article 5 states that the countries shall take measures to ensure that domestic workers enjoy effective protection against all forms of abuse, harassment, and violence. Article 15 states that the members should ensure that adequate machinery and procedures exist for the investigation of complaints, alleged abuses, and fraudulent practices concerning the activities of private employment agencies in relation to domestic workers. If such rules already apply in the case for private agencies, should government agencies and officials be actually subjected to even higher standards? Sixth, 
we have RA10361 or the Domestic Workers Act, also known as Batas Kasambahay of 2012. Article 3, Section 5 states that the employer or any member of the household shall not subject a domestic worker or kasambahay to any kind of abuse nor inflict any form of physical violence or harassment or any act tending to degrade the dignity of a domestic worker. Finally, as stated by Senator Zubiri in interviews, violators and household members and staff may also be prosecuted in violation of Article 266 of the Revised Penal Code, which covers the commission of slight physical injuries and maltreatment. On this note, I would like to end my presentation and turn you over to my colleague, Dr. Maria Elisa J. Lau. Maraming salamat po. Salamat, Oliver. Mel? Thank you, Oliver. I think my task here is just to summarize and bring the discussions home with the question of what exactly is at stake. So as uh, mentioned by Mele earlier, there have been studies on this particular phenomenon prior. Oliver, if you can move the slide. So we're looking at a study which we have quoted, no? Domestic Workers and Diplomats Households, and this was done in 2011. And it stresses the innate risk to domestic workers, all the more in this particular context, aside from um, what has been documented um, elsewhere, as Ellen has mentioned. So because uh, it takes place in what is called the private sphere, where you're looking at a very hidden and informal nature of the tasks, as explained also by uh, Jean-Pierre earlier, uh, it's very difficult to see exactly uh, what is going on in this gray area. And on top of that, to add to that vulnerability, uh, the household is not just any household, it is the household where you have a diplomat who is, um, who has particular immunities, who is of a certain stature in this country, which is not the domestic workers own. So you are looking at a very specific type of vulnerability and a very specific type of risk for an already risky occupation. Next slide. And this risk is also defined in the definitions now of conventions like the Vienna Convention. And if you will see how they define what a diplomat is versus how they define what a private domestic worker or yung tawag nga nila ay private servant pa, ano? uh, And this is separate from uh, members of the service staff in the diplomatic mission. So it is not uh, a, a relationship that um, will automatically require additional protection. Next slide. And as mentioned also, this is a privilege. Now, this is something that uh, the diplomatic corps can do to directly hire um, OFWs uh, for their uh, households at post. Next slide. And what the study has seen, not just in the not just in Philippine cases, but in other cases as well, are minor violations, and some have been outlined by the case studies prior. Uh, these include breaches of labor law, including failure to provide full wages, failure to compensate for extra hours, or failure to respect legal notice periods or to pay indemnity. Until the major violations, next slide please, where you will see uh, withholding of wages and then excessive work hours without days off, um, failure to provide adequate accommodation and food and restriction of movement. Um, and in the living conditions, some are forced to sleep on the floor and then deprived of food apart from leftovers and denied of basic hygiene. And as we've seen um, in this current case, suffering physical, psychological, and or sexual violence. Next slide. In terms of remedies, the study mentions that it can be raised with ambassador or the head of the international organization. But in this case, you have um, the ambassador also 
as um, the employer. Um, it can also mean delaying or refusal of issuing permits for domestic workers or threats to withdraw or actually withdraw privileges, unilateral privileges to diplomats. And then declaration of the diplomat as persona non grata. So these are some of the remedies that can take place um, at post so in the host country. Next slide. But one thing that I would like to say is that there is another risk that we as um, Filipinos should also pay attention to, which is the risk on our actual foreign policy. So we are in this case um, not doing what we say we will be doing as the Philippine state because our third pillar, pillar of foreign policy is assistance to nationals. And this is exactly the opposite of what is taking place um, right now in this context. Um, I leave you with this because I, I, um, I'm happy to converse with um, the, the author of, of this particular yes. piece as well. So this is where I will leave you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mel. So you ended with Liberty Chi. So maybe now let's go to Dr. Chi, Liberty. Um, uh, can you just share with us your thoughts? Uh, there. Hello, Liberty. Hi. Good morning Hi. or afternoon. Good morning there. Good afternoon here. Okay. Yeah. Firstly, I want to thank, um, of course, uh, Melissa and Melai for inviting me. And um, it, I'm very happy to see some familiar faces. Um, Ellen Sana is here. And of course, I met her for the first time ages ago. I don't know if she remembers me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was very long ago. Um, yeah, I just want to make three very quick points, right, in, in reaction to what uh, has been said and also um, to follow up on, on Melissa's last point. So firstly, I just want to say that, you know, the norm and practice to protect overseas Filipinos as it exists today is relatively new, right? And this has only been around for, let's say, 30 years, right? So, and there... And, and you know that this is a norm that has been put in place, that has kind of uh, elicited all of these new regulations, new practices for which the Philippines is well known. Um, because in other countries that also send migrant domestic workers, there is active resistance among their, their diplomatic core, right? To, to not be saddled with this responsibility. And there are, you can of course ask yourself like, why is that, right? So I'm not going to name names. Um, so, so the key is to understand that this norm uh, developed, right, is in, is in place, but can it, it can also be eroded, right? This norm can be eroded, right? And now we kind of, we can look at the past, right? Um, um, the key case of Flor Contemplation, of course, in 1991, that was such, a, you know, a massive event that um, elicited all of these changes, right? And now we have to ask ourselves, is this event key, right? To um, begin norm erosion, right? So this, this norm of protecting Filipinos and all of these um, um, practices and, and, and institutionalized uh, uh, regulations, right? The second question is, all of these cases that were discussed in detail by our panelists sh should make us question, right? Whether our diplomats actually believe what um, um, they practice in public, right? Do, have they internalized um, these uh, principles, these values that they are, you know, uh, advocating in public as part of their public persona, right, as part of, you know, the diplomatic corps carrying out these, these, uh, the, you know, the third foreign, foreign policy pillar. And if we see, you know, case after case after case, it looks like that, you know, in private, they don't believe what they say, right? So then we should ask ourselves, is there something in the formation of Filipino diplomats at the DFA that kind of, that prevent this, you know, this 
internalization, let's put it that way. The, the technical term is subjectification, right? Is there something in 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 the, the formation of Filipino diplomats that um, that that uh, makes them kind of resistant to um, um, carrying out the specific uh, uh, function. Um, and the last point is, uh, and again, going back to what's at stake, right? So what is at stake for not only the DFA, but the entire, you know, migration uh, bureaucracy, and of course, all the civil society um, organizations actively pushing um, um, uh, for a rights-based approach to migration, right? So if, if the Philippines is understood to be a leader, right, in these various areas by, you know, in, in these various capacities by various actors, from the bureaucracy to the, to the DFA, to Filipino civil society organizations and their partnerships overseas. If we are understood to be uh, leaders, let's say, that, that translates to recognition, right? And that recognition translates to access to these various international fora and various international platforms. It translates to um, influence, right? Now, if we do not resolve, right? And, and, and the last point is that, you know, this access and the influence um, uh, translates to actual resources, right? Whether it be technical capacity or actually financial resources that kind of forms this virtuous circle that enables all these different actors to, you know, to, to increase their capacity, right? To um, carry out the, you know, the third, you know, foreign foreign policy pillar, right? So to act on it, right? So it forms a it, it forms a, a a virtual circle. Now, if we fail to to address this issue full on, right, and and to get justice for uh, the parties involved, what does that do, right? What does that do to this vir virtuous circle? Right. What does this do to the role of the Philippines as you know, a, a norm leader and norm entrepreneur? So I'll stop there because okay. I don't have answers. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Liberty. Um, I'll pick up from your second point no, about the formation of um, Filipino diplomats uh, because uh, we have been receiving already questions no, from the floor. From Rick Casco, there is something seriously wrong in their pre-departure training. FSI should be there. How is the credentialing system gauging character and psychological health? Um, from Leslie Angat Dula, will there be any chance to let employers undergo trainings or at least be informed of GAD or VAUSI perhaps? Okay. Um, uh, where is that? Are there efforts to, Riza Francesca Regala, are there efforts to inform migrant domestic workers of their options for legal assistance uh, in host countries? So th these are a set of um, questions no, about um, how, how do we prepare us or OFWs who, uh, about their rights, etc. So maybe Ellen, um, because the question here uh, concretely, for example, is, is there a PIDOS for um, domestic workers, um, uh, uh, for domestic workers, uh, uh, yeah. is there a PIDOS, Ellen, for yeah, domestic okay. workers of um, diplomats? Oh. Melai, that's actually something that we do not know about. Of course, we mm -hmm. are happy to note that, again, Philippines is recognized as a model in terms of, like, how we develop information, uh, uh, materials and how to prepare our migrant workers for the work abroad. We have pre-employment, mm -hmm. we have pre-departure, mm -hmm. we even have the post-arrival. But then when it comes to domestic workers being employed by domestic, by diplomats, that is the blank spot, unfortunately. And that's why it's yeah. really going, it would have been good if yeah. we have people from, yeah. Yeah. from, from foreign affairs yeah. to clarify that mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. But I guess that's also, that could also be a recommendation, right? Yeah, to make yeah, yeah. sure that they know that um, um, they're not supposed to treat to be treated <coughs> otherwise just because their employers are diplomats, right? Yeah. So, okay. Um, Sedge was supposed to join us, but unfortunately she could not. No, so we could Sedge Jimenez. So we we now just proceed to the open discussion. There are also questions. Um, 
about uh, diplomatic uh, immunity no? from Lester Nabata. I'm really concerned about the abusive diplomats getting promoted despite the case against them. Something needs to be done about the diplomatic immunity, which is obviously being abused by them. There should be a law or policy addressing this issue. If proven guilty, these diplomats should be removed from their post to prevent repetition of the abuse. Are there any initiative being planned or arranged by the government or other stakeholders to address this problem? Okay. I guess the quick answer to this is that there's no, I don't know of any government initiative. I just know our initiative, right? <laughs> <laughs> to push that, you know, this Ambassador Mauro case be resolved towards that direction. Because otherwise, if there are really no consequences, um, it's just really going to go on and on. So this is really going to be an acid test also for DFA. Let's see to what extent are they going to compromise their own rules and their and, and our constitutional laws and uh, everything. So let we, we need to see that. And uh, of course we can push that. But I think the answer to that now is that, I don't know, does anyone know of any reforms in this regard? Uh, Melissa, Oliver, do you know if there is um, anyone questioning uh, diplomatic immunity? Uh, there's also a question here where what is the civil service rule? What is the DFA disciplinary code? How can direct har be liberalized when our own department? The, the thing is, I think, Ellen, if uh, please correct me. Again, the answer is we don't know. No? We don't know if there are rules. Uh, Melissa, can you share the, there was some POEA rules, right? Is that correct? Can you clarify? Now, this is just a POE rule that allows direct hire. Um, okay. It's a memorandum circular 2018. So I think this is not the guideline or the rule we're looking okay. for. Okay. But I, I do understand and I hope that the DFA really takes seriously uh, to task um, any investigation and any mm -hmm. recommendations that come out of uh, internal investigations on the case. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for so far, a lot of your questions, unfortunately, the answer is that we don't know. <laughs> Uh, there probably should be because, I, I mean, there should be some internal rules somewhere uh, uh, b because employment is supposed to be governed by contracts anyway. So these contracts should be sh should also be governed by or guided by internal rules, right, about employment. So, um, and I, I think we need to raise here the issue that iba pang level ng diplomat sa level ng hindi diplomat, right? Yung sa diplomat, yung sa ambassador, uh, as Oliver uh, mentioned kanina, mukhang tama naman yung ginawa ng DFA na, di ba, kumuha ng directive from the president and now they're investigating. And now we just, we, we really just need to push na, you know, if those videos are authenticated, there, there's no justification for that kind of behavior. No? So let's see, let's see how the, the DFA uh, will go. Are there other questions? Uh, from Omar de Jesus, will there be a case filed in the host country given the offenses are done there? Um, can anyone answer this? Melai, I'm yes. actually responding to Omar now. So okay. I wanted to say that, of course, many countries of destination, particularly like Geneva or New York or Canada even, they have a mechanism where you know, regardless of whether your employer is a diplomat or not, you can file for redress. But in mm -hmm. the case, the present case, my understanding is even the, the domestic worker is back in the country. So both are in mm -hmm. the country now. So the, the, the domestic worker can actually pursue her case in the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, there's one here from Angela Ilagan. Training of diplomat employers might help to prevent this terrible situation of a diplomat, yeah, whose job it is to protect Filipinos, who she herself physically harms. And I suggest that there should be a DFA policy or law that prohibits all foreign service officers, ambassadors, consuls from being bring maids and drivers from the Philippines to their um, uh, foreign posts. Um, uh, yes, in, in, in fact, no, this is why we call them domestic workers. It's really workers. They're supposed to be bound by, by, by certain laws and, and certain labor standards. Um, 
Yeah, again, there's no, I, I, we don't know of any DFA um, uh, policy. And I think what was raised earlier also is the issue that, you know, um, it's actually taxpayers' money, right? Especially when diplomats hire domestic workers as part of their staff. So in other words, it's really the state employing this, this worker. So it, it, it's, there's, we also need to ask, kailan ba may, obligad, may obligasyon ng Estado? Kailan naman pwede mong ituring na personal lang? Diba? Because the lower level foreign service personnel also employ domestic workers. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. ang tanong doon, uh, syempre, galing yun sa pockets nila. Diba? Yeah. Hindi yun estado. So, um, pero magkaiba ba ang accountability nila? No? Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yun yung, yun yung kailangan din natin uh, uh, tanong yun. Um, But Melay, yes. If I may, if I'd like to check with uh, Pierre about the mm -hmm. case where the employer was uh, not the ambassador, mm -hmm. did she actually invoke diplomatic immunity? Because I think I'm recalling that she actually did. So it's like, uh, okay, you 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 you're not you're not on par in terms of the salary, but then you still invoke the diplomatic immunity, and of course that was why the the case also dragged on for for four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's the first issue. But the second issue is, uh, is the solution going to be that okay? Then we have to lobby that our foreign personnel are are uh, decently paid. But then what is decently paid? And again, we're talking of our own funds to, to mm -hmm. provide to these this workers. So, or, or is it a case of like, there is a big discrepancy between the salary of an ambassador and those of the rank and file at the missions? So maybe that's yeah. something that we also have to, to interrogate. Yes. No? Yes. Because yes. I wouldn't want the solution to be, okay, pay them higher so they can afford to pay the domestic worker. I don't think yeah. that is the solution. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you should. Um, I don't know. Um, there, there's also a suggestion here that maybe they should just hire, you know, domestic workers in the host country. Exactly. I mean, you know, maybe you don't really need live-in um, domestic workers. You can hire uh, domestic um, services, domestic work services for for on an hourly basis, for example. I mean, I mean, the point is, um, uh, it, it it can be done, no. Uh, so, so yun yung mga kailangan din natin uh, tignan no, in terms of, of practices. Okay. From Rick Casco, problem with the discussion here, there is no one from government who can let light to the questions. Yes, yeah. But we're not going to wait for government. I mean, you know, they don't want to talk about it. We're still going to talk about it. <laughs> because dito. Okay, but I think it's clearer also what we are engaging. Uh, I don't know if there are government uh, employees here. I mean, the thing is... Uh, Mahirap din naman lahat din, no? In the sense na, I think we should also recognize domestic work is important to, to anyone. Diba? Diba? You go abroad, you become a diplomat, you become a foreign service, you have kids. Of course, you have to be able to raise your kids properly, etc. But the point is, it's not supposed to be an excuse to oppress somebody else. Right? So if the way you take care of your kids oppresses somebody, hey, you have to find another way. Right? So I don't know. Uh, so, so, so these are the things that really, uh, yeah. So maybe what we can do is that after this, we can consolidate all the questions and then send them to the DFA, right? And maybe, can we do that, Ellen? Yes, and uh, Geneva Forum also, our friends from Geneva Forum still here. And maybe, Melai, just to, mm -hmm. to add, we're actually talking of not only diplomats from the Department of Foreign Affairs, because at least in, uh, in yes. one of the cases that we handled, the yeah. diplomat mm -hmm. or the attache came from another agency from uh, trade. So, yeah. so yeah. this should yeah. be covered, you know, not only like DFA, we just don't just single out the DFA people, but yes. uh, those others yes. as well. Everyone that's posted abroad. Okay. Yes. And also, mm -hmm. Melai, we'd yeah. also like to reiterate based on previous work done by the Working Group of on migration that the mm -hmm. pandemic also has made domestic workers here and abroad more vulnerable 
and yes. this this should also be highlighted no as we yeah. as we look at this particular case and how similar cases might be happening as we go through this extraordinary year yes I, I think that's the Melissa that's also the alarming part eh, of this ambassador Mauro story um, if you look at the well if you look at the news the, the reports no nagsimula siya nag yung mga videos march exactly at the start of the pandemic tapos tuloy-tuloy hanggang September di ba so parang that's also can you imagine doing this under a pandemic right or or can you imagine experiencing this under the pandemic so definitely uh, that that's a point uh, that we should uh, uh, pursue are there other questions From Rodora Bano, Irene, how can direct hire be liberalized when our own diplomats and show our showcase of abuse? Yes. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Or maybe other, um, other comments? Kasi kung wala na, we can wrap this up with um, uh, maybe a few words from each of the speakers. No? Um, Shall we start with the last speaker to the first speaker? Melissa, would you like to, to, to uh, make some parting? Yeah, I think this is, a, this is a serious issue that calls, you know, the very, calls into question the very heart of our, the pillars of our foreign policy, which is to protect uh, Filipinos abroad. And um, it's difficult to accept, I think, especially for those of us who, who watch foreign policy and who, who also are uh, somehow concerned with the migrant uh, sector, no? that we will have to deal with the people that we trust um, in, 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 this, in this particular case, so that the people that are supposed to be trusted are those who actually are uh, the perpetrators. And I think that's a that's really a call to action. And I hope that even if, as as Rick Casco said, you no, know, the government is not here. I hope that they 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 listen. I hope that they are here to at least, in some way, shape, or form, here to listen and to try and you know to understand why we are in this particular point right now. Why is this the issue now? And of course, what can we do um, to prevent this from happening again? Okay, thank you, Dr. Lau. Um, Mr. Oliver Quintana, some words from you. Uh, hello. Uh, siguro sa akin, no, it's very important to continue our conversation with the government uh, to always be, uh, to always extend the hand no, in, in, this, in the sense that we would always invite them no, to continue this discussion. Uh, and hindi tayo susuko na pag-imbita sa kanila because at the end of the day, uh, it would always, I mean, be done, involves both parties, no? both the government and its citizens. And uh, I think this is a good uh, start, no? this conversation is a good start to open up this topic, which oftentimes, as sabi nyo nga kanina, is a very sensitive issue. But at the end of the day, no, we put the worker, no, the domestic worker, at the very heart of our conversation. Because domestic workers, like other workers, they're all they they are entitled no to, to to respect to protection no uh, of their fundamental rights no and, and this applies to all dom domestic workers no including those employed by by our di diplomat diplomats and ambassadors uh, foreign service officers so okay. i'm very excited actually because i think this will be a, the beginning of a very long conversation which hopefully will produce uh, results that we, that we can hold on and apply to prevent other cases from happening in the future. All right. Okay. Thank you, Oliver. Um, John Pear, are you still around? Can... Is Pear still around? If not, maybe Joseph? Hello. Yes, Joseph. Yeah. Uh, what can I say? Uh, after more than 30 years in Geneva, I've realized that we need to organize our 
you know, OFWs so that they would be able to assert their rights. So what we're doing actually is we try to uh, encourage them to join trade unions because in Geneva, uh, the trade unions have already started to organize domestic workers. Also, I would also encourage that there be a strong Filipino community presence because ano yan eh, parang checks and balances eh. If you have a very strong Filipino presence in the community, mga strong Filipino organizations, we are able to, you know, kahit pa paano, dialogue with uh, embassy officials. And sometimes it works, no? Uh, so I think it's, at this point, uh, kailangan natin ano, mas, mas paigihin yung pag-organize ng mga tao. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, is John Pierre here? Yes, he is here. Pierre is here. Pierre, maybe final words? A few final words? There he yeah. is. Okay. There, please. I don't there. Okay, probably he's having a problem with his connection, no? Um, so can we now go to Ellen? Ellen, please your final words. Yeah. Uh, salamat Mela at salamat sa ating lahat. Ako parang ano, very so, parang hope springs eternal. Kaya nga saan eh. Sorry. <laughs> so, Please. ang... Yeah. Sorry, are you speaking no, to me? No, but what I wanted to say... Okay. No, no, no. I'm supposed to be... We're asked to give our last words by Melai. So, I, I go ahead or you go ahead? Yeah, maybe. Are you okay now? You can go ahead, actually. No, wala talaga. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think problem okay. with the connection. Okay, so Ellen, let's just... Yeah, uh, so maybe the, just yeah. uh, uh, final words. Uh, I think the moment is uh, positive in the sense that uh, the, new, the secretary has taken actions forward. And let's uh, continue to, to, to monitor... Because this is like the first time that we've seen uh, an SFA taking immediate decisive action on cases like this. So that's one. But then I think it's quite important, as Joseph said, that uh, we need to really strengthen the ranks of the, the, the migrant workers, particularly the domestic workers. Uh, many years ago, we did not imagine we will have a Convention 189 that the domestic workers will be recognized as workers and that uh, they will be, it would be very, very difficult to organize them into unions. But now we have the convention, we have national legislations, even in countries of destination, and we have IDWF for one, for example, as a forum for the migrant domestic workers. So there's a lot of things that are going for us to make things happen for the better. And I hope that uh, our DFA and our diplomats will not be left behind with all of these mm -hmm. uh, steps that are being done mm -hmm. uh, forward, no? yeah. in the forward direction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I, I think, let me close with that, no? in the sense na actually this is why this is frustrating. Eh? Diba? Kasi the Philippines is touted to be, you know, a, 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 the best model in in migration management and in protecting migrant workers, you cannot be best if you have an episode like this, right? Or episodes like this, you cannot be best. That is not best practice that actually, uh, it's actually abuse, right? So I think um, we should drop the labels and, and, and try to really focus on the realities no, and the experiences and try to solve them. So I guess the first thing we need to say now is that, you know, this conversation 
it will not be complete without government talking to us or without government talking to domestic workers. So I guess we, we have to always also extend an invitation. No? Uh, so to DFA, consider this and uh, a standing invitation. No? Talk to us, explain to us, and help us understand. Uh, and you know, and ensure us that you're really going to go the direction of your own laws and your own um, policies. The next point I wanted to make is that uh, the point also of um, a lot of the speakers is that, you know, the best way to protect domestic workers is to empower domestic workers. And that is where organizing needs to come in. Kasi kahit naman walang batas, kung kaya niyo ipaglaban yung karapatan niyo, may paglalaban natin, di ba? So, so that, that point of empowerment, I think, is very, very important. Uh, but let me just close this webinar with a quote from Novelita Palisok. No, si Novi, the chair of the United Domestic Workers of the Philippines. Ito yung sabi ni Novi. Isang paglabag sa karapatang pantao ang ginawa ng Philippine Ambassador. Sa alang-alang din sana niya, ang isang kasambahay ay tao rin. May dignidad at malaking kontribusyon sa lipunan at dapat ratuhin ng maayos. Ito ay dapat aksyona ng ating gobyerno para maparusahan at malagot ang ambassador sa kanyang kalapastangan at pagyurak sa dignidad ng isang kasambahay. We are workers, not slaves. Okay? To our non-Tagalog speaking friends, let me just translate that. What the Philippine ambassador did is a human rights violation. She should have considered that the domestic worker is also a human being with dignity and contribution to the society and should be treated well. The government should act should act on this to hold accountable the ambassador for her wrongdoing and for trampling on the domestic worker's dignity. And let me just repeat that final statement. We are workers, not slaves. So to United and to all the domestic workers out there, I think we absolutely, totally, wholeheartedly agree with you. You are workers, not slaves. No? And in fact, in this day and age, there should be no more slaves. And rest assured, we will work with you. We will fight with you to end this kind of uh, modern day slavery. So to our speakers, Ellen, Joseph, uh, Pierre, Oliver, um, Melissa, um, Liberty, thank you so much for your inputs no? and for your time. To everyone, thank you for listening and for participating. Uh, have a good afternoon and stay well. And uh, maraming salamat sa lahat. At syempre, maraming salamat sa Rappler. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat.